What's going on, smart people? Bringing you another episode of Tensor Calculus for Physics. At this point, if you've been following along, we have established all of the foundations. We know how tensors transform, whether they're covariant and contravariant, and what that means, what the metric is, and what it's used for. And at this point, now we are ready to start asking questions, namely, what does it mean to take the derivative of a tensor, and is, more importantly, is that going to be a tensor? That's what we're going to be asking today. We're going to be showing that there's a problem. That's the main objective of today. When we take derivatives of tensors naively, there is a problem. We're going to put a name to the problem. We're going to define the affine connection. And then in the next video, we will be asking, is that thing a tensor? Is the affine, or are the coefficients, the Christoffel symbols, do they transform as tensor components? And then in the following video, so probably two ones from now, we will be talking about covariant differentiation. That's what this is all leading towards, the covariant derivative. So the first thing that we're going to start off with today is we're going to recall how components of vectors transform. So if we have some vector component in a prime frame we'll call x prime i, that transforms as xj and then its transformation coefficient. So it's going to be a dx prime i dxj. And at this point we're not making any assumptions about what these coefficients are, which is really just telling you, I'm not telling you what class of transformations this transforms as a vector as. That's not too important yet. What I want to do right now is I want to take the derivative of this with respect to time. Okay? So that's what I want to do. I want to say, what is d prime i over dt? So we have like the components of a position vector, and I'm taking the time component. It's like a velocity. So I'm basically saying, how does the velocity transform? So when we do that, well, we actually have these transformation coefficients out front, and they're not necessarily constants. So we need to do product rule when we take the derivative with respect to time. So this is going to be uh, dx prime i dxj dxj dt. That's exactly the transformation rule for a vector. That's nice. But there's also that that product rule term. So we've got plus, I'll bring the xj out front, d dt of dx prime i dxj. Now what is this thing? So we're taking the time derivative of the derivative with of, the, uh, of our new coordinates with respect to the old. Now these are going to be functions of the old coordinates, which will be functions of time. So we actually have to use chain rule to take this derivative because this relationship, we have like basically this x prime i is like our f, which is going to be a function of maybe our old coordinates, which are functions of time. And when we take the derivative of this with respect to time, that's going to be, we need chain rule. We need to do our df dx uh, dx over dt plus df dy dy dt and so on, maybe if there was z-dependence. So that's what we have to do here, only now we'll adopt Einstein's summation convention, because why else, why, why wouldn't we? Um, and the reason we're doing this is because we're kind of making assumptions that it doesn't matter which order we take derivatives in, so we can go ahead and pull that partial derivative out. I will make some remarks on what it means if you can't make those assumptions later on, but let's assume that we can, in which case when we apply a uh, chain rule for taking the derivative of this, so this is going to be written as dx prime i, oops, dx j, dx j dt plus x j, and then I'm going to take out that d. Um, so we've got a d squared x prime i dx j, and like I said, we're summing over that that chain rule that dx dx, dy, dy. So I'm going to call that something else. We'll call that dxk. And then we take the derivative of that kth coordinate with respect to time, the total derivative, dxk over dt. Okay, I hope that wasn't too fast for anybody there. It's really, we're just using chain rule on these transformation coefficients. And this kind of ruins things. This is supposed to be the transformation rule for a vector. We have our other vector and the old coordinates, transformation coefficients that relates the new to the old, and that should be equal to our new vector in this new frame. But we also have this other term here, and this is a bit of a dilemma because we like to think of velocity as a vector. 
And so what gives? What is this term? Is it zero? Can we justify it being zero somehow? And in our case, if we choose, the, the, the answer to that is, is it depends on what your transformations are. Under certain transformations, yes, this will be zero. And we'll do a quick example to show how in everyday physics that, you're, that you know and love, this term just goes to zero. So as an example, let's consider something like a rotation. Okay, so in our primed frame, we may have just x prime, y prime. And we know how they're related to the unprimed. Like x prime is just equal to x cosine theta, you know, plus or minus plus uh, y sine theta. And here we're taking second derivatives of this with respect to the coordinates. So if we build up our transformation coefficients, dx prime dx, that's just cosine theta, dx prime dy, that's just sine theta. So whether or not we take derivatives with respect to x and then with respect to x again, or x then y, or y then y, these are just constants. So when we take these second derivatives, they're just zero. So for things like Galilean transformations or rotations, these transformation coefficients, these pesky second derivative terms are just zero, and we recover our transformation rule for vectors that we know and love. But under more general transformations, more general coordinate or reference frame transformation, that may not be the case. So there is a bit of a problem here. When, do, when does this happen? And it all comes from the second derivative term. Um, but what do we know about second derivatives? What do those normally tell you? Well, it holds information about things like curvature, right? You can do like your second derivatives to find out if your curve is concave up or concave down. There's something to that in these second derivatives. And to give a bit of an analogy, one thing that's often used is the idea that if you have someone that's, say, confined to living on the surface of a sphere, and they have no concept of up and down, they just know that they can move around the surface of the sphere. Well, their position vector is defined. They can go anywhere on the sphere, anywhere in that space they can define with their position vector on that surface of the sphere. So if we have our little, let's just go ahead and draw one. We have the, the little ant or whatever that can you know, traverse the sphere. But let's put them right here. Uh, if we want to take, if we want to talk about something like a velocity, well, a velocity is a vector that is tangent to the position vector. The velocity vector would be pointing off of the sphere. And this ant knows nothing about this whole space out here, this whole tangent space. So where these problems of derivatives of tensors not transforming as tensors what it comes down to is that your space might have some sort of curvature to it. And this is where, it, and it kind of makes sense because what we're trying to do is we're trying to compare vectors at different points. But if we have a curved space, then these vectors are in different spaces and it doesn't really make sense to ask how they differ. Or we need to modify, we're eventually going to need to modify our notion of a derivative in, util, in order to handle something like this. So this is where it all comes down to. Now the logical next step is uh, we're going to jump out of a plane. So we're going to jump out of a plane and we're going to be holding our favorite, pick your favorite flat earth physics book, and we're going to jump out with it. And when we do that, we're going to impose a set of coordinate system, uh, or a set of coordinates on ourselves centered on us because it's all about us. And we can describe the position of our flat earth physics book by a four vector that will index with an alpha. So we'll say x alpha. I'm going to put these little bars up here on the x because I'm going to use a lowercase in a bit and it would get confusing. Um, so we're going to we're going to this is going to be used to parameterize the position of our uh, of our flat Earth book, and this is going to be a four vector. So relative to us, that book shouldn't be accelerating, right? We're falling at the same rate. So what that tells us is that the second derivative, d squared x alpha, with respect to the proper time, we always want to differentiate with respect to a scalar, should be 0. And now what I want to do is I want to, there's a, I don't know, maybe a creationist on the ground that is looking up and he's seeing the flat earth book falling down and it's saying it's clearly accelerating and we'll have some set of coordinates for that person. I don't know why I'm picking on flat earth and creationists right now, but uh, so we'll say that we're doing a transformation such that these x mu of, actually I'm going to make it an alpha, sorry. 
our functions of this little x, we'll do a new. Why not? OK. So when we substitute this into this little free fall equation here, we're going to have to run into that little chain rule thing again, the product rule and chain rule. So let's go ahead and do that. So substituting this in, we get, well, we're taking the derivative with respect to the proper time of the derivative. Well, let's, yeah, that's fine. The derivative of x, oh my god, over d tau. Okay. And when we take this derivative, we have to use chain rule. So this is going to be equal to d over d tau. Then we're going to have a d big X alpha. Sorry, I forgot my alpha. Over, let's say, dx little x mu dx mu d tau. And these should be total derivatives. Uh, d d tau. Okay, so now we have this time derivative acting on this. So this part is just this. And then we're taking the time derivative of that. So we need, uh, we need product rule and chain rule. So this is going to be a dx alpha dx mu d squared x mu d tau squared. So that's the first term in the product rule. And then we have a, uh, well, now we need to differentiate this with respect to time, so we need to use chain rule for this. So it's going to be a d squared big X alpha. We'll do dx mu dx nu dx nu d tau dx mu d tau. So all this term is, is we've taken the derivative of this with respect to tau. And just like in the previous example, we had to use chain rule, which is why we have second derivatives again. And then we have the total time derivative of our, uh, the product of our chain rule. And then the old thing, just this. Okay. And to kind of reveal the acceleration of this flat earth, flat earth, book, flat earth book with respect to the ground frame, I want to get this dx mu d, d tau squared uh, by itself. And the way that I can do that is by multiplying by sort of like the the inverse uh, the inverse transformation element of this by using the fact that we'll have d little x we'll call it lambda d big x alpha and then we've got d big x alpha dx mu is just the Kronecker delta d lambda mu because they're inverse transformations. Okay, so if I multiply this equation, which should still be equal to zero because we just substituted it into this, we just substituted this relationship into this, which gave us this, so it's still equal to zero. Uh, we want to multiply both sides of this by this dx lambda dx alpha. So when we multiply this, that's just this term here. So this is going to equal a delta lambda mu d squared x mu over d tau squared plus dx lambda over d big x alpha d squared. It doesn't look like it's getting any better, but we're going to redefine something in just a second. dx mu dx nu uh, and then these, these time derivatives here. dx nu d tau dx mu d tau. Please don't make fun of my mu's. I'm very self-conscious about my mu's. This is equal to zero. So we have this Kronecker delta here multiplying this. So we have a mu downstairs, a mu upstairs. All that happens here is we sum over mu, which changes this mu to a lambda. So we can write this as, do I want to write it there? Um, I'm going to go ahead and write this stuff up here. So I'm going to erase this relationship. So this just becomes a d squared x lambda d tau squared plus, and I don't feel like writing this term out every single time, so I'm going to give this a new name. And what should I name it? So we're summing over alpha, so whatever we call this shouldn't have an alpha index on it because we're summing over it. 
However, at least here, we're not summing over mu, nu, or lambda. So I'm going to call this gamma. We've got an upstairs lambda and then two downstairs indices mu and nu. So I'm going to call this part here gamma, uh, which has these indices. So it's going to be gamma, lambda, mu, nu, and then these time derivatives, or these uh, proper time derivatives. dx nu, d tau, dx mu, d tau is equal to zero. And there we have it. Okay. This object here is called the affine connection. And under usual circumstances, it doesn't matter which order we take these, these derivatives, because in general, or usually, I shouldn't say in general, uh, derivatives commute with themselves or with each other. So it normally doesn't matter. Theories where it does matter, theories where you can't make that assumption, are said to have torsion. And for the most part, for the foreseeable future, we won't really be considering that. So we will assume that we can interchange derivatives, which tells us that these gamma, lambda, mu, nu's are symmetric about the covariant indices. So we have this kind of acceleration term and then this, this, these uh, affine connections and these like velocity type things. And we can compare this to something like a free fall, d squared x over dt squared minus this gravitational acceleration equal to zero. These are both accelerations, which means somehow this object, these, these, this affine connection, is somehow related to the gravitational field. And in future videos, the next one, we're going to be zeroing in on the affine connection and the, and the coefficients, which are the Christoffel symbols, exclusively. And we're going to be talking about how it transforms. In a future video, I could talk about the, the Newtonian uh, limit where we can try to really analyze this and how it's connected to Newtonian physics if you guys are interested. So we're going to be talking about this object a lot in the next two videos when we define the Christoffel symbols and the, um, and the covariant derivative. So now the whole point of this video was just to show that there's a problem. Whenever we take derivatives of tensors, here we've been taking it with respect to time. But in principle, you could be taking derivatives with respect to coordinates, and the problem still arises with things like divergence and with curl. So it's not just time that's special, it's all. So um, I hope you guys found this video at least interesting. So far, all we've done is we've shown that there's a problem. When you, you can't just take derivatives of tensors and expect the end result to be a tensor. So in the next couple of videos, we'll be showing how we can go about fixing it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.